I changed my opinion on the Gypsy Rose situation in less than 24 hours. Let's talk about it. She shows how much of a narcissist she is. She says she's taking accountability but she puts this out on the media. So many people, and probably some that are watching this right now, are like, oh, but she survived it. She's so strong. Ah. Ah. I think Gypsy Rose is a sociopath. Kris Jenner works hard, but Gypsy Rose's PR team works harder. Am I the only one noticing the mass manipulation that's going on right now? Am I the only one that sees Gypsy Rose's red flags? I call bullshit on everything Gypsy Rose Blanchard has said. I have literally spent the last three days watching every single interview, every single documentary, every single everything that I can about this woman, and she has manipulated the entire world. Salutations. Today we're going to talk about Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Well, actually, we're not going to talk about Gypsy Rose Blanchard per se. She's more so an indirect instigator to a conversation that I think is important to have and is quite necessary. And it's something that I do notice a lot online. I sort of say that in all my videos. This is something that I notice online, but this is definitely something that I notice online. And I think that Gypsy Rose is a very good, very effective example of this phenomena, which I see time and time again. And I think we need to talk about it. I don't think we do talk about it because it has everything to do with audiences. And I think as creators or as people who post on the internet, we rely on audiences. And I think as creators on the internet, we are in a bit of a rock and a hard place of being dependent on audiences for views and engagement and obviously our income. And then at the same time, there are things that we ask or that we have sort of qualms with, with regards to our audiences. And so, you sort of need to navigate it quite effectively because there is a clear power imbalance that we don't want to address because it alienates, because it's uncomfortable. But at the same time, I do think it's important. And at this point, I have faith in you that you are able to understand where I'm coming from without taking it too personally or as an attack on you because we are all human, we are all flawed, and it's very important that we speak honestly with each other about this. Now, if you don't know who Gypsy Rose Blanchard is, I, I don't really know what to say at this point. I am expecting that everybody has at least heard of the name, especially in the last couple of weeks. After eight years behind bars and before that, a life confined to a wheelchair, Gypsy Rose Blanchard will soon walk free. Now 32 years old, she's set to be released early from Chillicothe Correctional Facility in Missouri tomorrow, where she served a shortened sentence for the second degree of her mother, Dee Dee. Gypsy becoming the mastermind in her mother's slaying after a lifetime of abuse. I actually didn't even want her to be I just wanted out of my situation. And I thought that that was the only way out. Dee Dee claimed her daughter had the mental capacity of a seven-year-old and made her use a wheelchair and even a feeding tube. Gypsy Rose estimates she had as many as 30 surgeries that she didn't need. But Gypsy Rose eventually began to question her mom, and it all took a turn when she met Nicholas Godijohn through an online dating site. In 2015, the duo hatched a plot to free Gypsy. It was Godijohn who stabbed Dee Dee to while Gypsy Rose hid in a bathroom. The two arrested and charged with now, after Gypsy served eight years of her 10-year sentence, she was released on parole in December of 2023. Now, what I want to talk about is what has happened since her release just over two weeks ago. Gypsy has gained online notoriety like nobody else preceding her. With only 17 TikToks, she has amassed over 9.8 million followers on the platform, as well as 8 million followers on Instagram. And her videos receive well over 10 million views per upload. This is crazy. I mean, it has to be a record at this point. So I took this picture on December 28th. Gypsy Rose Blanchard had this many followers. I took this one on Sunday. So December 31st, she had 1.7. I took this one on Monday, January 1st. So in one day, she went from 1.7 
to 6 million followers in one day. I took this one today, January 5th, and she's at 7 million. Then one of her most viewed videos has 75 million views. And then these other ones have over 20 million views. This is just crazy and mind blowing to me. I mean, I don't know if anyone has ever blown up like this or this fast. And this fame was uncanny. It was uncanny because it went from a high to, I would say, in a matter of days, a real kind of semi-low. Comments went from, do you like listening to Mitski? Dubbing pictures of her over Lana Del Rey songs and everybody being tipsy for Gypsy to, well, this kind of thing. Gypsy Rose is manipulating her audience again. This is very interesting because a lot of people were really rooting for Gypsy when she first came out and they were like, we love you. Yes, Queen Slay. But now people are starting to see through the facade and her mask is starting to slip. I don't associate myself as a m Jip Jip has a lot of blue in her aura. Blue auras do not like to take accountability. When you take accountability, you move out of victimhood, okay? And blue auras are also master manipulators. So I want you to listen to her language as she proceeds to tell us all why she's really not a m uh, if you think about it, yes, I had a part to play in it. I requested, I asked Nick for help. Planning the requesting the person to do it, it's giving conspiring. And how that all conversation started was, you know, he was saying that he would protect me from anyone. I said anyone. He said yes. I said even my mother. He said yes. And then the, the plan kind of formed from there. But he's the one that did the actual Not me. I can't anyone. That's why he's in trouble to begin with, because he's the one that did it. But for Gypsy, Nick wouldn't have her mother. She's still looking for that loophole. And I'd say that most of this hate stems from a soundbite of Gypsy talking on a podcast about her then boyfriend and convicted Nicholas Godijon, or as he calls himself, Mr. Smiley. But I think the real source of the hate really derives from what I would call the end of the honeymoon period. And this honeymoon period, I would have expected to last for a bit longer than it has, but interestingly, it really has not. And I would more bluntly call this severing of the honeymoon period, young people not being as progressive in their thinking and expectations as they like to believe they are. Now let me explain, because this is the premise of this whole video, and as I said, I think that this Gypsy Rose Blanchard situation proves it and shows it stupendously. Now I'd just like to preface this by saying that I'm not a fan nor a hater of Gypsy Rose. I am very into analysis of things, and I find Gypsy Rose just a very interesting person and public figure to analyse for this very reason. Her being in jail or not being in jail makes absolutely no difference to me, nor to my faith or lack of faith in the criminal justice system. What I've noticed around the infamous rise and quasi or semi-fall of Gypsy Rose Blanchard in the eyes of the internet is that people have really coated her in these false categorizations that they are then blaming her for not meeting. In other words, rather than blaming their false categorizations of Gypsy Rose, the internet is beginning to blame Gypsy Rose for not fitting into those preconceived categorizations. Gypsy Rose it's absolutely a fraud and I have proof. Roll the clip. I don't associate myself as a because if you think about it, yes, I had a part to play in it. I requested, I asked Nick for help and how that conversation started was, you know, he was saying that he would protect me from anyone. I said anyone. He said yes. I said even my mother. He said yes. And then the, the plan kind of formed from there, but he's the one that did the actual not me. I can't anyone. That's why he's in trouble to begin with because he's the one that did it. So when they say I'm a I don't identify as that. What are your thoughts? She shows how much of a narcissist she is. She says she's taking accountability, but she puts this out on the media. I am telling you, after seeing this interview, I already thought she was kind of sort of not being 100% honest, but I really think she's a fraud now, and I think she'd re-offend.
That's just my thoughts. This for me is an example of a false categorization. And you can see this in words being used by this creator, such as taking accountability. Now, the idea of taking accountability fascinates me because it is everywhere on the internet. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, what does accountability look like from one person to the next? Because there is no standardized or universal understanding of how accountability manifests itself. That is, there's no standardized route to accountability. Who determines once accountability has been realized and met? As I said, it manifests differently for each person and their circumstances. For Gypsy, accountability may look like writing her ebook release, which was a reflection on her healing process. It may look like spending eight to nine years in prison. Accountability for Gypsy may look like how she has processed everything in prison and how prison has shaped her and molded her into the person that she is today. Watching the documentary, I was again captivated by how you spoke about prison. You spent a lot of time in prison doing a lot of reflecting. You've mm -hmm. talked about the importance of therapy mm -hmm. and how you rely on that. And to me, it seems like there's a, an earnest and clear effort from you to reinvent yourself, to mm -hmm. almost reprogram you know, yourself right. and you went all this abuse that you went through. Do you remember that moment in prison that you know, you thought to yourself, I'm going to make the most of this because not mm -hmm. everyone does that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we're a show that we like to talk about the fact that you know, life is about making mistakes and mm -hmm. learning from them. Not everyone chooses to learn from their mistakes, mm -hmm. but you clearly were someone who seems like they tried to make the most of their time while in prison. And yeah, do you remember that moment? Was there an epiphany of like, I don't want to be this person. Mm -hmm. I actually want to take accountability for the role I played mm -hmm. and not let this define me. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was a there was a class that I took, and it was called um, ICVC, um, and it's called it's a, an acronym for um, Impact of Crime on Victims. Okay. Um, and I took this class. It was a twelve week class, and it it's all about accountability. And so, as I was going through the courses, I realized that I had made mistakes before my crime. I had made choices before my crime. And I feel like even though I didn't get in trouble for those things, this was a chance and an opportunity for me to honestly learn from those things that I've done in the past. So, and I completed that class and actually went back to teach the class. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it, it, was, it was really enjoyable for me to pass the baton on and just kind of like teach others what I have learned. It was a, a very impactful class for me. And it, I think it's sad, you know, there are people that don't want to better themselves. But for me, it was always known. It was it was part of that freedom to do, you know, things with my life that I've never done before. So one of the first things I did was, you know, get into GED classes because I wanted to better my education. Mm -hmm. Accountability for Gypsy may look like being an activist. And in today's world, being an activist is spreading awareness via social media, via a documentary series, via being a public figure. People call her the master manipulator. It wasn't that. It was the other way around. And that I call bullshit. It was the what other way around? Millions of people have seen the act have watched these interviews. Yo, you have got to be fucking kidding me. Other way around. He doesn't take accountability for nothing. Now the lookalike of the mother is speaking and saying that it was the other way around. Damn, bro, not you being manipulated by her too? I told y'all this shit was coming. Like this shit is going to unfold. What this TikTok and others like it demonstrate to me is that accountability is not seen as something that each person does or has and that we trust each person with. Instead, I have an idea of what accountability ought to look like. And if somebody else who is meant to be taking accountability doesn't meet that criteria or that categorization of what I perceive accountability to be, then they can't be doing accountability. We're being intimate for the first time, so the spark is plenty alive. What are we doing? You know? Like, as a country, as a society, what are we... 
I'm going to be real. People don't know what authenticity is because authenticity is something that is so idiosyncratic, so specific to each individual person that inevitably it's not going to fit into what you perceive of it because it's something so internal, so innate. And oftentimes, if we're going to be really honest about it, we really don't want people to be authentic because we really can't predict authenticity. You can't understand or know what it is, especially not through the lens of social media, where everything is ultimately curated content for consumption. You make things that people can consume. Therefore, you're not really putting your true self out there. You're not going to be your authentic and real and genuine self because nobody will be able to relate to that. Nobody will be able to garner any kind of kinship with that. And so nobody is really authentic. Online success, particularly from influencers and brands, hinges upon their ability to appear authentic and to be trusted. We want to know what we can expect from an influencer. A consistent authorial voice and gradually revealing information makes us feel like we are listening to a friend. And this is where I have a problem with this idea that we've established around authenticity. Because knowing what you're going to expect from somebody is only possible with a character because you know the character, you know their story, they're created and therefore you can follow their progression. You can't really know what to expect from somebody who is being authentic because they're not going to be perfect at all. They're not going to follow any kind of script. They're not going to follow any kind of narrative that you have preconceived beyond them and their authenticity. And so in my opinion, in Gypsy Rose being authentic, she's actually garnering a lot of criticism because she isn't following the script. She isn't following the narrative. She isn't following the character arc that she ought to be following. And she's being blamed for that. When in fact, this is probably her authentic self. Her authentic self is probably being quite performative, pleasing other people, really being a public figure, whether it be through her late mother, Didi, or whether it be through social media and making her own image. Some kind of fame or infamy has always been a part of her life. And so how she navigates that and how she understands herself through that lens, through that very integral part of herself, is likely her authentic self. So I think this is the issue with the idea that we have of authenticity. It looks very different to different people. Some people's authentic is in fact being a public star, being infamous, being famous, being unhinged, what have you. Now let's get into present times. Whenever she's asked about Nick, she essentially says that she just needs to worry about herself and she shows zero remorse for being responsible for somebody's life sentence in prison. She also massively manipulated a young autistic boy and got him to her mum and he is now spending life in prison. Not her, she's out. She's on The View. She's living her best life. She's sitting there with millions of followers now. Meanwhile, she's never showed remorse for putting this man through this. Never taken into account that he was intellectually impaired and was diagnosed with that. She just married old dude while she was in prison and she's off living her life having her release party, which I'm not saying she didn't deserve to be released. Let's be clear. I think she should have gotten out of prison. While it's becoming a literal TikTok trend to have Gypsy Rose release parties and it's all over the country people are having parties for them. He has to be in prison for the rest of his life. Now I find this incredibly telling and very interesting. Now because a lot of these people making these videos, these TikToks and these comments are young, I'm going to assume that they haven't really grasped how long eight years is. Gypsy spent nearly three thousand days. That's three thousand days in prison. That is three thousand days away from Nick. That is the span of long-term relationships in this day and age. They haven't been in contact, they haven't communicated, they haven't seen each other. She has clearly evolved and developed into the person, the woman that she is. We don't know much about him beyond what he has said to the media as of late. He should, based on what I've read about him, based on his communications with the media later, 
lately as well as statements that he has made. I do not think that he should be in prison. I think that he should be in a mental health facility and institution. I most definitely do not think that he should be released. He should not be among the public. I do not think that he is well and I think that it was fortuitous for him, for his personality, for his problems to have come into the life of Gypsy Rose and to have found the perfect victim in Dee Dee Blanchard. That is just my gobbledygook on that. It is very understandable to me and just based on considering all of this, considering how Gypsy has described and detailed her time in prison, how it really helped to structure her for her to mature, for her to experience being amongst other people. It is understandable to me why she is not interested necessarily in Nick, why she has most definitely moved beyond this, especially considering that she has pursued relationships in prison and she is now married. Was um, there any part of you that is as excited as I'm sure you were to be released? Mm -hmm. You know, you spent eight and a half years there. Something I was so kind of captivated by by watching your documentary mm -hmm. was you referencing that despite being in prison, mm -hmm. it was your almost first taste of freedom. You know, it really the ability was. to make friends, to mm -hmm. do things for the first time. Was there any part of you that almost had any reluctancy to, you know, leave that space and mm -hmm. the friends, as crazy as it might sound, yeah. be in prison? Mm -hmm. Was there any nerves? Of course. I mean, um, I had built a life for myself. I call prison a world within a world because even though it, it's uh, people have this misconception that um, prison is the same thing as a jail and it's not. Actually, a jail is confined. It has cells. Um, there's toilets in the room, um, but prison, you actually have a key to your room. Yeah, they keep it as much um, homey, I guess you could say, quote unquote homey for inmates as possible. They have jobs in prison. They have um, activities. Um, actually, we even had a Super Bowl party last year. So, I mean, prison is is a world in itself. And so um, it was hard leaving my friends behind because I have some friends that have some very lengthy sentences. Mm -hmm. So the you last- You wanna give a shout out to any of them? Yeah, yeah, to Amelia Bird. Okay. Um, you know, she actually has a very similar case to mine. Um, and her case was, you know, features on podcasts as well. So, um, you know, I was very close with her because we had a lot in common. I say we both have mommy issues. <laughs> <laughs> So, and lean on each other. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's interesting that these same young people who are probably all about living for the present don't look to the past. The past is the past. You need to grow and develop as a person are now demonizing her for doing exactly that, for growing as a person. And of course, she isn't growing in the way that they want her to grow. So it must be wrong somehow. And I think it is so easy to look at other people's actions, to look at other people's decisions and to moralize by proxy. Why didn't Gypsy just report her mother to the police or to medical professionals? Why didn't she just leave? And I get there were repercussions when she ran away, like being tied to the bed that one time. However, I feel like there were other routes you could have taken. Like you didn't want to speak out at your doctor's appointment or anything like that when you found out you could walk and you weren't allergic to sugar and all of these things. You could have get up and show one of them that you could actually walk. You had multiple times you could call and reach out to anybody for some help, but you got on that internet and wanted some dick. Like she could have done anything else, anything. She only tried to run away one time. I could walk, I'm not disabled. I don't have cancer. I'm not having any treatment for cancer. Like she could have done something to change her situation. Gypsy could fucking walk. She could fucking walk. You're telling me she couldn't go to the fucking neighbors or something? And you know, I would hazard that if you were to say the same thing about a woman or a man in a relationship with an abusive partner, if you were to say to them or to say to these people moralizing about Gypsy, why didn't this woman or this man just leave? Why don't you just leave your abusive partner? Why don't you just get up and walk out? They would be taken to the dry cleaners for filth. There's so many actions that all of us do where we think on reflection, why didn't I do otherwise? Why didn't I say this instead. Gosh, what a zinger moment if I had actually just said this in response to this. I think when we are living our lives, inevitably we are not thinking moralistically. We are not thinking about tomorrow. We are not thinking in the future unless we have the privilege or the means to be able to extend ourselves further into the future, to project ourselves further than from getting from day to day. None of us can know or will ever likely know what was going through the mind of Gypsy, what 
was going through the mind of Nicholas. None of us will really know why she decided not to just walk away. And I think in the fact that none of us know, we cannot possibly say that we would have done otherwise because we honestly do not know. None of us have been in that kind of situation. None of us have lived the life of Gypsy Rose Blanchard. And it's very important for us to remind ourselves of that before moralizing about it or before saying what she ought to have done on reflection because apparently she's a bad person and we as good people know what we would have done. This reminds me of debates that are still happening today surrounding Germans during the era or the reign of the Third Reich. Why didn't Germans try to save the Jews? Why didn't Germans try to do more? Why even today do we all walk past a homeless person? Why don't we try to help them? Why don't we invite them into our homes? Why don't we feed them? Why don't we give them money? I think it's so easy to moralize and to prescribe when we are not actually in touch with the reality that we are moralizing and prescribing. Reminder, this is not a documentary. It is a theatrical release series released with the explicit reason to make money. Reminder that this is not Gypsy Rose Blanchard. This is an actor depicting a role in a way that she knows how. Reminder that the real Gypsy Road Blanchard is on record saying she is unhappy about the act, the movie, saying that she felt much of it was not told correctly and that she did not like her portrayal in it. Reminder that this is a young, deeply traumatized woman who was put in a horrible, impossible situation. Reminder that her getting out of prison is not justice. Justice would have been her never being there in the first place. Justice would have been other adults in her lives being involved enough to know something was horribly wrong. Justice would have been those other adults intervening and not allowing that situation to happen in the first place. Reminder that this is a young woman who is just now starting to reacclimate to society after a childhood of abuse and trauma and an adolescence and young adulthood spent in prison. In a notoriously abusive system in its own right. Leave her alone. If she ever wants to talk more about what happened to her, she might. Or she might not, and you are not entitled to that. Gypsy Rose is defying very strongly held assumptions of what it means to be a victim and how said victim is meant to behave. Hey y'all. So I want to introduce you guys to someone very special. This is Pixie. She is an eight-week-old baby mousey puppy. She's currently happily married. She's making good money. Apparently, the D is fire. And she is a celebrity. And this has very noticeably been winding up a lot of people and sort of giving them what I would call the ick. So this is your happily ever after, the gal who liked being a princess. It is, yeah. I had to kiss a couple frogs to get to this one. Here's some face. Oh, thank you, baby. I don't know, guys, there's something about this that just gives me the ick. And I can see this in two kinds of responses. The one response is people who see her as just a PR figure, as somebody who is being controlled by a PR team and is therefore making a lot of money off of this. And that ultimately her activism isn't in line with their idea of what activism is meant to be. She ought not to be making as much money from her books. She ought not to be making as much money from her docuseries and from just being a public figure on social media right now. Now Gypsy Rose has just been released from prison. She's made about five million dollars so far from different interviews and different products and stuff that she's involved in. Lots of, uh, she's got the book coming out, she's got the docuseries, it's going to be even more money and obviously her book will do really well. Social media, she's blown up everywhere. Now I don't have a problem with that per se but I do think if your aim was to come out of prison and get your life together, move on and do some amazing work with other survivors like you said in Montreal syndrome going on all these different tv shows and you know talking about your life and how great things are like you're famous being all over instagram talking about your boyfriend's big d it's not really helping her cause the other response which i think is very telling and very interesting because it is coated in i think the sentiment of being caring or wanting the best for gypsy is comments that go something like this i wish she would have just had a quiet release and live a quiet life on some farm or something. I like to call these comments, which I have seen scattered across the internet, left, right, and center, the peace and quiet conundrum. The peace and quiet conundrum for me is something that exposes a real problem, I think, that we have when it comes to mental health and our generic understanding as a public about mental health. And it is one of the main reasons why I 
do not believe anybody when they publicly say that they care about mental health. Hot take, I know, but in my opinion, caring about mental health is far more in line with being an aesthetic than being a reality for a lot of people. The similar undertones to these comments are that Gypsy needs her peace and quiet, that she needs to live a quiet life off of social media and away from people in order to heal. Because of course, spending nearly 3,000 days in a prison cell isn't enough for you to heal, for you to reflect, for you to mourn. And this is where the conundrum for me comes in. The perfect victim, or even the perfect criminal who is released on parole, does the following. They stay cooped up in an isolated abode, repenting for their sins, unable to leave the house, let alone get out of bed because of all the trauma and guilt that they hold. Gypsy Rose needing peace and quiet, or needing to be left alone, isn't what makes Gypsy Rose more comfortable. It's what makes us more comfortable. If I was to prescribe a remedy of peace and quiet for Gypsy Rose, I would have to ask myself the following question. Does her peace and quiet make me feel more comfortable in my assumptions of how someone should handle such high, exaggerated levels of fame and fortune? Am I thinking of Gypsy Rose when I'm prescribing these remedies? Or am I thinking of what makes me feel more comfortable in my prescriptions for the world and the people in it? What I found in my very unusual and abnormal childhood as well as adulthood is that oftentimes a lot of concern that people show me is actually them just wanting to feel secure in themselves, wanting to feel secure in their own decisions and wanting to feel secure in their own understanding of how the world works, of how people work, of how mental health and mental illness works. Because of the success that Gypsy Rose has been experiencing, because of the amount of money that she is inevitably making and going to continue making, because everybody loves Gypsy, because she isn't being the stereotypical victim, we want that to go away because it makes us feel secure in our understanding of what a victim ought to look like, of what a victim ought to be. A victim is meant to be poor, they're meant to be powerless, they're not meant to be successful, at least they're not meant to reach the levels of success that Gypsy has reached without being a victim. They're not meant to be happily married, they're not meant to be enjoying the D, they're not meant to be a celebrity that everybody wants to know, that everybody wants to get a piece of. This is completely unheard of and abnormal. And because it's completely unheard of and abnormal, therefore it must be wrong. Therefore, Gypsy must not be a genuine victim, or at least she's manipulative, she's a trained actress, she's obviously putting on a show, she's obviously just trying to make as much money as she can off of a situation that happened to her. And this is why I say that young people are really not as progressive as we like to think that we are. Yes, Gypsy Rose Blanchard is a bad person. I do not understand why this woman is being so universally praised now that she's gotten out of prison for orchestrating the murder of her mother. And I don't understand why people can't see through the fact that while yes, uh, she was the victim of a terrible crime, this is still a master manipulator. This is still someone that conspired to member of their own family and now she's being glorified for it and even worse made it rich by it. I would say that the reason why people really liked it and genuinely based on comments that I've seen people liked it when she was behind bars because she wasn't on social media and therefore she could be presented as the perfect and ideal victim. She could easily be categorized and characterized because she didn't have a voice and now Gypsy has a voice. She has opinions, she has perspectives, she's a bit dorky and a bit awkward. She's doing things on social media that could be considered cringy. Gypsy Rose in prison is very different to Gypsy Rose on social media and with autonomy. And this is the thing with social media, because the more that you put out of yourself, the more that you expose of yourself, the more likely it is that people are going to increasingly not like you because they're going to find out more about you. It's just the fact she's come out of prison after eight years and she's now a social media influencer and she's basically famous like she's got paparazzi following her she's got media outlets constantly doing like articles on her following her every move like i didn't realize she was like a britney spears type of person like i knew it, her case was big but i didn't i didn't think she was going to come out and be quite as famous and as influential as she is i don't know is anyone else getting this because like every time i see her on my for you page i'm like what is it what is it about you that i'm not liking why am i not why am I not as obsessed with you as you were when you were in prison? 
and I didn't actually know anything about you because you couldn't communicate to me on social media. Like, what's happening? And this is where that conundrum of authenticity comes in. Because the more authentic you are, the more people think that you're not authentic because they don't like your authenticity. And so that must not really be who you are because they've got an idea of who you are and who you're meant to be. And because you're not following that, you've changed or you're just manipulative, you're lying or you're PR trained. And you know what? All these things may be true, but at the end of the day, who actually knows? It's only been two weeks after all. And this is where the saying, never meet your heroes, really comes into play for me. Because the thing with meeting your heroes is that once you meet them, you realize quite quickly that they are people and they can no longer be an ideal or a fantasy of your making. Safely locked up or voiceless in the peace and quiet or being left alone somewhere to repent for everything that they've done or saying the things that we want them to say. Gypsy Rose just ended her social media career with her own words being used against her. So an old clip of Gypsy Rose talking about her mom just went viral. In this clip, she said that during interviews with her mom, her mom would squeeze her hand when she wanted Gypsy to stop talking about something. Well now, you've probably all seen the clip of Gypsy doing exactly that to her husband. For those that don't know, there's an interview of Gypsy squeezing her husband's hand, which in Gypsy's own words means that she wanted him to stop talking. It's the worst that could happen. Here it comes, right? This is horrible. It's hard to do, but... There. Did you see it? Now watch Ryan's face. Can we just take a minute to look at their faces? Like, this is right after she shushed him. And this is another thing I find quite interesting because people say that she's saying what her PR team wants her to say. But then on the other hand, they want her to say what they want her to say. So we, we don't really want her to say what she has to say. We don't want her to say what Gypsy Rose wants to say. She either says what we want her to say or if she's saying what the PR team wants her to say, that's just bad and wrong and inauthentic. There's really no room for actual authenticity in all of that. My mom was in prison with Gypsy Rose and I made a video about two years ago basically interviewing my mom asking her questions about like how she thought how what were her first impressions of gypsy rose and everything like that and that video is getting a lot of traction right now my mom said that she thought gypsy was lame and i'm not paraphrasing those were her exact words and you might be on the other end of the spectrum and honestly no one is saying it so i'm just gonna say it i do not think that we should be giving gypsy rose as much attention as we are by paying attention to her as much as we are now i am not a judge so i don't personally have enough education to decide if she is fully like reformed or if she did the time that she should have done i don't think that her legal system is like the best but i know where my abilities lie and in the justice system I'm out. I don't really know if she should even be out, but she is. So I hope that she's reformed. I hope that she's learned. I hope that she has grown. When it comes to Gypsy's story, I understand like that Munchausen by proxy is a thing and that she was poorly, horrifically mistreated. And I genuinely have so much self-awareness and I'm one of the most empathetic people I know on this planet. With that being said, is one of those mistakes that we forgive? Is someone ending someone else's life something that someone can come back from? In all regards, in all aspects, because if so, there's a lot of other cases we need to be looking at. Another thing, I had a horrible childhood and I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys all about it. I've been through a lot at the hands of my mother and at no point ever in any of those circumstances and situations, even the time we got kidnapped, did I think, my mother's life needs to end. And they talk about how sheltered she was and how she didn't know anything of the outside life. Then how did she know how serious was? How did she know that what would get her mother to stop was I have a lot of questions and seeing this newlywed game with her and her husband is not answering my questions and it just feels inappropriate to me. Does anyone else feel like I just, it feels not right to me. It feels strange, it feels weird. Um, I don't know. I don't know because no matter what I've been through and I just feel like something evil has to live within the depths of your soul to ever consider that period point blank end of story. 
And I don't think it's funny that she's sassy. And this is something that I also really always wonder about when people talk about the criminal justice system, when they talk about somebody reforming, somebody growing, somebody reflecting. What do these words even mean? Because nobody describes them. It's like accountability. We all say these words because they sound good, they sound pretty, they sound mature, but we never actually define them. And I think we don't define them purposely because if we were to define them, we'd realize that all of us have very different definitions and explanations for them based on our own personal histories, our own personal experiences, our own circumstances. And that will make everything very muddled. So what does Gypsy Rose reforming and growing mean? Because what it seems to mean, at least based on what I can see of Gypsy, based on my analysis of her, is that for her, growing and reforming means writing her book, means doing this docu-series where she can actually talk about what actually happened, how she actually felt about everything growing up. She is using the most global and most universal form of raising awareness, the internet, to raise awareness about Munchausen by proxy. I feel that if she wasn't using social media, people would be criticizing her for not using the most obvious means of raising awareness for the benefit of helping actual victims, of helping people who may be in her situation. What other realistic alternatives are there? What ought she be doing? And I don't think we ask ourselves these questions enough. I don't think we ask ourselves enough. What do these words that we use actually mean? What does it mean to me? What might it mean to somebody else who is living in a completely different set of shoes and circumstances to me. I think on the internet, we like to feel united. We like to feel like we are in community or camaraderie with other people. And therefore, we have to avoid these conversations because divisions will inevitably arise when we realize that we have very different understandings. Or we pretend that we have the exact same understandings because that just makes everything appear easier. That makes the world seem far more understandable. I have a lot of questions and seeing this newlywed game with her and her husband is not answering my questions. And it just feels inappropriate to me does anyone else feel like i just it feels not right to me it feels strange it feels weird um i don't know I don't know. And that's where I know that this isn't about gypsy. This isn't about concern or consideration or impartial analysis and understanding of gypsy. Because as this young woman says, and I quote, it just feels inappropriate to me. It's about you and it's because it's uncomfortable for you, which is perfectly fine. But I think that there does need to be some awareness that this is about how you feel, not about how gypsy or those in her situation feel. And I don't think it's funny that she's sassy. Oh, that final jab. I, I don't think it's funny that she's sassy. <laughs> Okay, well, each to their own. And that's the thing. That's the thing as well. That's sort of what I mean by this. That this is about how other people feel uncomfortable about her, about what she does, about what she says, about her autonomy, about her having a voice and using it in ways that we wouldn't use it, for instance. This is about how we feel. It's not about how she feels. It's not about what's in her best interest. It's not about Gypsy. It's about us as an audience. She's become too successful. She's become too outspoken. She's not showing the kind of remorse that we would like to see that makes us feel comfortable in our interpretation of what remorse should look like. I share my story to be a cautionary tale so that the next person that might be in a situation like mine where they are in an abusive relationship or they are feeling trapped, they don't take the route that I did. I just have a question that broadly relates to this idea of Gypsy Rose being on social media and speaking out about her experiences and about everything that she's gone through and the success that has come with that. How do people think that things are going to change unless people speak out? In many cases, people are inspired to leave their abusive partners, for instance, because they've heard of somebody else who has left Left their abusive partner because of awareness being raised via social media, especially today. Spokespeople are never going to be perfect. They're never going to be ideal. They're never going to be what we may expect them to be. They're never going to be Mother Teresa's, for instance. And I think that that is very important because I think it is very important for us to realize that victims do not in any way ever look the same. They do not have the same experiences. They are not by 
mere fact of being victims good people. They are not, by mere fact of being victims, innocent. They are far more complex than that and far more in line with the human experience that we all actually are a part of. And I do see this as generically being a kind of infantilization of the victim. An infantilization which I do think in our current zeitgeist has a lot of power to it. There is a lot of power in being, ironically, the seemingly defenseless victim in being the powerless victim. And I think the power often comes in this idea of there being sort of these immutable characteristics that victims hold. Immutable in the way of, for instance, being a person of colour. You are therefore, by mere fact of that immutable characteristic, a victim, according to many in our current cultural zeitgeist. And I do find this very telling that oftentimes those who purport to be progressive are really not progressive at all. To believe in immutable characteristics determining your life and the trajectory of your life, to believe that there is a standard, that there is a universal of what said person should look like because of being a man, because of being a woman, because of being a black person, because of being a white person, because of being a Gypsy Rose Blanchard, is inherently anti-progressive. It's inherently either very stunted thinking or very deterministic thinking, which is the antithesis of progressive thinking. And you know, I think that it is very okay and very human of us to simplify and to categorize the world based on how we think it should be or how we believe that it is. However, I think it is okay if and only if we are willing to acknowledge that we do that in order to cope with reality, not in order to define reality. Coping and defining are very different things. We do it in order to make sense of a world that is very complex and difficult to make sense of. But when we use that coping to define reality, I think we get into very murky territory where, as I said, we enter the antithesis of progressive thinking or progressivism. Because I think it is very interesting and very telling in looking at these young people making these TikToks that they, who likely just based on looking at their other TikToks, see themselves as quite progressive thinkers, as quite progressive people when it comes to the world, when it comes to others, are really showing a lack of progressive understanding or progressive thinking when it comes to their awareness, their understanding of how mental health or mental illness works, an awareness that it is very easy to moralize by proxy or when you are not in the shoes of another person and on reflection than it is to moralize when it is actually you in a particular situation or or when you don't know all the information inevitably about a situation and how a lot of language about accountability and reform or growing and healing, being left alone or living in the peace and quiet of it all is more so about feeling comfortable in ourselves, about how we think things should be as opposed to about the person that we are projecting that onto. Because I think the problem comes when our own simplifications and expectations of how things should be, of how victims victims should be, of how X group of people should be, becomes that person's or those people's problem, that person's fault and not our own. Because Gypsy isn't living a quiet, sheltered life away from the media, away from social media and away from the fame, there must be something wrong with Gypsy. I think it is not only way too soon to assume that there's something wrong with her, to assume her entire moral character of who she is, of what she's trying to do in a matter of quite literally less than three weeks at this point. But I think none of us can possibly know what Gypsy Rose has gone through and what is going through her mind every day. I think all we can know is what we see online, what we are told online, what we read in the papers. And of course, we need to come up with our own explanations for that. And of course, we have our own opinions about that. But I think there needs to be a reckoning with our opinions being informed by our own idea of how things ought to be, of how Gypsy 
democracy ought to be and or our opinions being informed by more so analysis of what is going on. I do think that just based on how the internet is, based on how things just happen on the internet, Gypsy will inevitably be seen as a fallen star at some point. I do think that this is just very much sensationalism around an individual, a very idiosyncratic, unique individual, and that everybody is crazy for Gypsy at this point in time. This will die, of course, as I said, the honeymoon period is clearly nearly up. But I do think inevitably we will get to know her a lot better as she is on social media for a lot longer. And as I said, once you meet your heroes, you realize that they are actually just people, flawed people like the rest of us. And soon that glimmer and glitz dies out, it wears out. And we find somebody else to project this idea of a heroic aura onto. So anyway, those are my thoughts on the Gypsy Rose situation, or more so on our response to Gypsy Rose. These are thoughts that I've had in general, but I think that this Gypsy Rose situation really provides a very crucial and interesting instance and example for me to explore and for us to talk about. I'd be very interested to read your opinions and perspectives on this, especially as somebody who may be either a fan of Gypsy or somebody who really does not like Gypsy. All opinions, all perspectives are absolutely welcome and I would love to hear what you have to say. But in that, please remember to be respectful. Please can we also all remember that none of us actually know Gypsy. None of us have any intimate ties to her. Who knows, maybe some relative will come across this video or something and please do share your experience or do share what you know or what you feel. I'd love to hear that as well. But please do, as I said, be respectful and understanding. Thank you so much for watching this video and thank you so much for your continued support. I would love it if you could subscribe to the channel. I am trying to reach 200k subscribers this year. That is my goal and it would mean the absolute world to me if you could help me to get there. Look after yourselves, take care, stay warm and I'll see all of you very, very soon in the next one.